Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Howdy, folks. It is Shay here, and I'm excited to be back for another episode, as always. So today on the show, we will be visiting with Callie Thorne. And Callie is a mentor and friend of mine. She has deep roots in agriculture, and she also does a lot of work as a mindset coach. And why that's going to be important today is Callie's going to help provide some tips and strategies to help you understand what impacts your mindset and mental health and what you can do to help navigate stress. So there's going to be some tips and strategies there to really help you live your best life as a beef producer, because we all know that cattle production, farming, whatever it may be, it can be stressful. We have a lot of uncontrollables that we are working with every day. It's just a part of our business. So that's why we're going to come to you today and offer some tips and strategies and talk through that so that you can enjoy what you do, because that's what we want. Now, before we dive into the episode, I want to let you know that October, November, and December is the quarter four Rancher Mind series, but it's all focused on business management, whether that's um, business plans, strategic planning, cleaning up your finances, alternative revenue sources. Uh, we might even touch on some egg lending and finding funding. So whatever it may be, we are going to talk about business management and ranching and help you as the cattle producer get things in line so that you can eliminate some of the stress in that area too. So what that looks like is once a month, we're going to have a conversation, plus there's two bonus podcast episodes that will be live in our private Facebook group. But these conversations are between you and industry experts in these specific topics, as well as fellow cattle producers. They're laid back. They're not your traditional webinar because they're super interactive and they allow you to ask the questions that matter most right away. So if you want information on that, go to my show notes and click on the Rancher Mind tab and that'll take you to the registration. And that's where you can register and be a part of our community. And if you have more questions outside of that, feel free to go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com. And from there, there's a contact us page and you just sit contact um, us. You That goes straight to my email. You type in that you're interested about the Rancher Mind events. Feel free to ask me any questions. And if need be, I'd even gladly hop on a phone call with you. So with that, be sure to register there. I'll see you in the membership because I know you want to do it. And let's chat with Callie. There are lots of nutrition tubs out there, but none can match the true blue commitment of Vitalix. Our tubs offer you the most concentrated nutrition at the lowest cost per day. That means more profit for your operation and improved performance for your cow herd. In fact, research shows Vitalix tubs increase feed efficiency by 20% while boosting conception rates, herd health, and weaning weights. Learn more at Vitalix.com. Vitalix, the true blue tub. Well, Callie, it is great to have you on the show today. I mean, I get to visit with you in real life here and there, see you at conferences, so... You finally get to be on the podcast, which you've been on the list for quite a while. So thanks for agreeing to join me for a conversation about mindset and mental health and uh, sharing some tips to help people reduce stress. Yeah, thank you, Shay, for having me. I'm excited. And I do. I enjoy getting to run into you on the road or wherever we might be, but we'll, we'll call it a Zoom day for now. Yeah. And you just did a lot of running last weekend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't bring it up. I told my husband the other day, I think I'm in, I'm in like the bad mood right now. Like you should have just finished. Right. Yeah. Goal was 56 miles on the Matahe and made it to 45. And that's when a big thunderstorm hit. So. You know, I was in Medora when that thunderstorm hit. So I don't, I don't blame you. I, I was at an outdoor wedding when that happened. So I don't your mom, your mom had messaged me. Yeah. That they were at a wedding. And I mean, I, I jokingly told my friend that it, it won't last long. Like it doesn't rain in North Dakota that often. Yeah. And 45 minutes later, <laughs> I couldn't tell you the last time I've been in a, I, I have no idea if I've been in a downpour like that, unless you run in the rain as a little kid, but nothing like that running out in the badlands. Yeah. <laughs> but so I guess that touched on a little bit of your hobby, your running side of things. Um, but what about your background in beef? Like, I know you have 
strong North Dakota roots in the beef industry. So can you kind of touch a little bit on what your background in the beef industry is and kind of what that looks like today too? Yeah, for sure. So we're up in Northwest North Dakota. When I, when I travel a lot, I'm noticing more and more my accent, apparently, (laughs) according to other people. And I have to tell them we're probably two hours from Canada and an hour from Montana. So way up in the corner there, but I am actually the fourth generation on our family's operation. I've got three little kids. So they're the fifth generation. And over the decades, we've been primarily cow-calf operation, but my husband moved up here when we got married about 14 years ago, and it seems like we were just willing to pivot a little bit during those times to create more opportunities. So added on a background in the feedlot, um, started running some yearlings. Last few years, we've sold some beef as well, and so kind of have a variety of enterprises going all at one time. But yeah, it's definitely always been in our blood. I always jokingly tell people I lived in what was once my grandma and grandpa's house, and then it was the house I grew up in, and now it's our house, which is cool, right? I mean, it's got that history and family dynamics, and then some people just feel really bad for me, like, oh, she lives in a nice old house. (laughs) (laughs) We're always updating, remodeling and stuff, but it's, it's a lot of fun raising my kids where I was able to grow up. Well, that is, that is exciting. And there are definitely two different mindsets to think about that, which is what we're going to talk a little bit about today. So I, that's your background on the beef side. So, but you do a lot of work with mindset and mental health, and that's how you and I actually got connected. So why did you choose to start diving in? to the mindset coaching and even the mental health side of it, because they do work together. Why, why did you start that? Yeah, for sure. A lot of people always ask even, even how I got into the speaking side. And I think that comes from the 4-H FFA background that a lot of us have, but then, um, I had worked for NDSU Extension for a few years out of college. And after that, I I really took a big pivot and ran my own business. I was in direct sales for quite a few years and had a large team, did very well with that, learned a ton about business and even leadership, entrepreneurship. And I think being with that direct sales company is really what opened my eyes to coaching. I actually went to a couple different um, coaching trainings and my thought, the whole idea behind it was like, this will help my team. I'll make a difference. I'll be able to get them, you know, help them with their businesses and stuff. But it impacted me even more than I ever thought it would when it came down to running my own business, my own mindset, my connections with my family and friends. And so it, it came back from that training thinking, oh, this is going to make a difference for my team. But in my brain, it was so life-changing for me that I thought more people need to understand this and how our brains work. And then the mental health, the leadership, I feel like it all just kind of tied in together from there. So it was probably about almost five years ago now that I joined the John Maxwell leadership team where I have the opportunity to do a lot of the kind of the speaking training, coaching, and receive some more specific training on coaching. And, and like you said, that's how we met, whether it's group coaching with people or one-on-one or running them through courses and stuff. There's just a lot of unique opportunities. And I just think it is like, changing. I mean, I I told that to somebody the other day, uh, especially when it comes to family dynamics and communication. Mm -hmm. It's like everybody wants to figure that stuff out, which we have to, it's important to know, like, what's the generation, what's the next generation going to look like, who's going to take over the legacy. But if we aren't willing to communicate and have those conversations, like that's step number one. And even before that, it's, it's what's our mindset? Are we willing to have conversations with each other? Are we willing to see different perspectives? And there's just so much that ties into it, I think. And it's, it's a game changer. So how has, you know, this mindset work you've done, you know, in your own life impacted how you interact on your family's operation? (laughs) You'll laugh. Somebody asked me one time at a conference, they're like, so does your family all get along perfectly and everything (laughs) because you do these trainings and stuff. And, and I laughed and I, I said, no, I think the thing that has made the biggest difference is an openness to seeing different perspectives or ideas. I'll often give the example, um, 
like when we started selling beef in 2020, you know, kids were getting kicked out of school at that time. And I was having to homeschool. A lot of my work was getting erased off my calendar. And I remember one night, my husband said to me, he's like, I think we should start selling beef, you know, because there was no meat on the grocery, in the grocery stores, packers weren't processing, feedlots were getting backed up. I mean, everything was just aligning. Mm -hmm. It was almost like that perfect storm. And I remember I just looked at him and was like, what? No, we're not going to start selling beef. Uh, but then within a couple of weeks, we had all the paperwork in to have a retail license. And I mean, that year from April to December, we butchered, well, not us, but at a processing plant over 150 animals and worked with over 200 families. So right there is one of those prime examples of mindset, right? I could have the thought of, nope, we don't know what is happening in the, in the world. It's crazy. I'm going to be fearful and scared. And you know, Shay, enough how I do coaching. If that's my thoughts that I'm believing, I'm not going to feel excited. I'm not going to look for opportunities versus that other voice saying, but what if, what if there's something out here that most people are missing? What if there's an opportunity instead of always seeing it as a risk? What if it's actually an opportunity? And the same thing has happened to us in drought situations, you know, where there's a drought, we can't control that. And so we think, woe is me, I'm going to have to sell off. This could be the end of the fifth generation or whatever, right? You could have all those thoughts, but then there's this, there are always other thoughts is what I tell people. So what are those other ones? Well, same thing. There's got to be an opportunity in this drought. How can we pivot our enterprises so that something does work? When everybody else is talking about what's bad, how everything is wrong, how we're all suffering, what if I look at it differently? Like, well, I mean, yeah, it sucks. That's the reality. There's hardships, a lot of hardships in agriculture, but I just, I'm not willing to live that way. I can't live every day in the heart and thinking everything is going wrong and it might not work out. Like, it's just not how I approach my businesses. And when you come from it at a different angle, I just, I think it changes your mood. It changes your connections. It changes relationships. It impacts finances, your business and everything. I also think when you have that energy, that energy impacts the people you're around to mm -hmm. in a positive mm -hmm. way. Like if you're carrying a positive energy, it will slowly shift into other people as well, whether they realize it or not. And the same thing can happen to you if they have a negative energy, if you're not cognizant of it either. But I do think it is a very powerful thing when we are cognizant of our own mindset. And like you said, thoughts. Exactly. You, you walk into work cattle or you walk into the shop and somebody has one attitude versus another, mm -hmm. right? It can kind of set the pace for the day. Yeah. I do have to say like that, like when I came home to the ranch, I was like, okay, those, one of those first spring cattle working days was coming up. And I was like, before I left my house, I was like, this will be a good day. <laughs> this will be a success. Like I was not like, cause normally I'd be like, Oh, it's going to be a shit show. Right. That that's the first thought that comes to my mind, but I changed that. And you know what? There was a lot less yelling that day. There was, if anything, because at least I wasn't reacting when stuff went wrong, you know, it's not like it was a perfect exactly. day, but when, even when one person controls how they're going to react, it makes a big difference. And that's, I think that's the hard part that people don't understand. You've, you've done enough work with me too, where it's like, and I'm still working. It's always a process, right? Of like, yeah, but he said this, or he did that, or she did whatever, or the cows got out, right? All circumstances. I can't control other people as much as we'd all mm -hmm. like to, right? But the only thing I have to remember is I can take responsibility for myself. So how do I want to show up? Yep. Something broke or yep. The cows got out or dad was in a bad mood or husband said this or whatever, but now I still have a choice in how I show up the rest of the day. Absolutely. And so, and we get to decide if it was a good day or bad day. Exactly. Day. Yep. So that's a little bit on the mindset side. Now I want to touch on the mental health side too. So I got to hear you speak at North Dakota Cattle Women's. We were both there speaking and you talked about generational mental health. So how do you define generational mental health? I think it's just taking that pause and looking okay, through the generations. I think that's one thing we're proud of in agriculture, right? I've already mentioned it of the number of generations ahead of me and what that looks like. But I think it's looking at, okay, how did they do before us? I, I often have a lot of stories um, of grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, and 
even in today's day and age, I think about, man, we've got it really good, right? I mean, I when it's almost 100 degrees outside, and I think, okay, they if they had tractors, right? Did they have cabs? Did they have the air conditioning? We complain when the radio's not working, right? And so just, I think sometimes taking that pause and looking at through the generations, what does mental health look like? But the big focus has to be now, how are we handling our mental health in this generation? Because as much as it's easy to compare and say, well, I shouldn't complain. Look how good we have it. Look at the equipment we have, look at how things have changed, how they've modernized. It's still hard in in this day and age. And so how am I affecting, impacting my mental health and those that are around me? Okay, Callie, so with that, how do you kind of break that mindset of, well, I have it easier than other generations? Because that is situational for what we're used to. And we have our own unique stressors. Like we have our own stresses that other generations before us never had too. So how do you kind of work towards shifting that and breaking that mindset so that you can be honest with yourself about how you are really feeling mentally and have a good grasp on your own mental health? Mm -hmm. I think the first thing that we have to be willing to do is pause and recognize how we are actually doing, right? Sometimes I'll even ask people, how are you doing? Everybody says, oh, I'm good, right? But then it's like, how are you really? I mean, things are hard right now, you know, or whatever somebody's situation might be. And so just seeing how, how are you really? And then, like I said, pausing to actually think about how am I? Because I think, especially in agriculture, we are so known for, let me just put on my Superman cape. We've got work to do, right? There's always work to do. Whether you're in agriculture, you're an entrepreneur, whatever the case might be, I could work 24 seven if I wanted to. There's just always enough work to be done. And I think that's a mentality that we've put in our head is we just can't rest. You know, there's always something we should be doing. We should be moving. We should be accomplishing. And if we're not, what are we making it mean? right? That I'm not a hard enough worker or that I'm less than or whatever all those thoughts are that maybe great grandpa put in our head. So I think pausing, recognizing how am I actually doing? And then it ultimately comes down to what are the choices I'm going to make? We actually talk, I do mental health first aid trainings, and we talk quite a bit in there about actually self-care. And I know that that's not a word that people often use in agriculture. I mean, who's got time for that, right? But when you look at the numbers in agriculture, I think it's something that we need to take a little bit more seriously because you can, you have the choice to take care of yourself and to take a break when you need it or to seek help or to have a conversation or whatever those things look like to you instead of having this belief in our mind that, nope, we have to work 24 seven. That's how my dad did it. And, and we, we equate like more work is going to equal more money, right? Or that there's going to be a payout in the end if I just put in a little more time and effort. But I think sometimes we need to figure out a way to work smarter, not harder. And there are a lot of options to be able to do that in agriculture. Well, and we connect our self-worth to our work. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, even if everything goes bad, at least if I worked as long as I could work, it was a good day. And that's not true. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so spot on that. Well, I, I actually had a friend say that to me one time where we we were just talking about defining a successful day, right? And for me, it's like, well, maybe I jumped on a podcast, I coached a couple clients, I launched a new course, I went for a run, I mean, all these things, right, that to me, might mean successful. And she's like, Oh, I had a great day, too. I got a massage and a pedicure and had coffee with a friend. And like, it was eye opening to me that I could deem that a successful day Mm -hmm. if I wanted to, too, but I didn't see it as work. I didn't define it as work. And so then I wasn't successful. So it's, it's all mindset. It's all those thoughts. What am I choosing to believe? And so much of that, like I said, goes back to that generational. What did mom say that has now I've believed it for so long. It's just become a habit, an unconscious habit. And I think that's where a lot of people ask, like, well, how do we change it, though? How do we begin down this different path? Or I can't change who I am. And you can, but it takes time. Like, it takes practice. It takes that noticing, slowing down, conscious, being consciously aware of, 
oh, there's that thought again, where I thought this is what we had to do. This is how we have to market our cattle because it's how we've always done it. Or wait, this is how dad is always set up on branding day. And so that is how we have to do it. But I think the biggest thing that has helped me is just there are choices in that every day and that whole pausing and recognizing and checking it can make a huge difference. Hey folks, you are working to preserve the ground for the next generation. Shouldn't your cow herd be built for the future too? Neogen is the industry leader in beef cattle DNA testing. They built the first DNA test for commercial cattle and continue to make advancements every day. Igenity Beef is a DNA technology that will help you select the most desirable females based on their true genetic potential with 17 traits, 3 custom indexes, and parentage. Watch Identity Beef catapult your genetic selections by assisting in selecting only the females that meet your operation's genetic goals. Use code RADIO to get 20% off your next Identity Beef order. Learn more about how Identity Beef can aid you in selection, management, and marketing opportunities of each calf crop and your herd. Go to neogen.com or call 877 877- Four four three six four eight nine, and that code and website are also in the show notes. So before we dive into kind of some more tips and strategies for when we are feeling anxious or stressed or anything like that, I want you, you made a comment about when you look at the numbers in ag, what are some of those numbers in ag when it comes to mental health? What are we seeing on surveys and however they're measuring this, what are we seeing from that standpoint? Agriculture is actually one of the high, has one of the highest rates when it comes to mental health issues, especially when it comes to suicide. And we have uh, for a very long time, actually, that's what the statistics have shown for years and stuff. And so sometimes when I'm doing classes or trainings or even speaking, I'll have people ask like, why, why do we think it's so high in agriculture? And everybody can guess, right? A lot of it has to do with finances is one of the number one things. Why it is so hard in agriculture um, just for many to make the finances float and it's getting trickier, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Also, it's those uncontrollables, those things that we aren't able to control. In other words, we can't control the markets, we can't control the weather. And so a lot of those things are often unstable and we can't control them. Um, And so things like that, often too, it can just be family dynamics, right? Just the added stressor of who's going to take this over or, or the question that people will sometimes ask too, of like, I don't want to be the generation to lose the operation, right? We're sixth, we're eighth, we're 10th generation. And what if I make the wrong decision and I'm the one that causes us to collapse? I mean, just that added stress is heartbreaking. And I think when people actually pause and think, it is truly incredible what people in agriculture do who run ag businesses. I mean, just the schooling, maybe they went to school, maybe they didn't, but the number of things from livestock husbandry to maybe they're farming, maybe they're trying to run the books, the finances, the communication. I mean, they're the HRs, they're the CEOs, they're the financial operators. And we take that all on when we're in agriculture and try to run all of those roles. Um, You look at other businesses, that's not how they're done, right? They hire somebody for each of those positions with their knowledge. And a lot of times in agriculture on a farmer ranch, we're trying to do all of those things as one person. And we might outsource some of it, but yeah, there are times where you just have to be able to do little bits and pieces, whether it's rewiring a tank or building fence, doing something with your hands or treating sick animals or whatever it may be. You're literally bouncing around to, I, I, I tried to count at one time how many different trades it would be. I have a post on it, but it, it well, was yeah, a lot. Like you, you just listed, right? Like I'm the electrician, I'm the veterinarian, I'm the, and then if you have kids or if you're married or, I mean, there's yep. so many things that play into it, the roles on just a single day on an operation. Which can make it fun and exciting too, but it, it, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we put a lot of that pressure on ourselves to be able to do all that too. Mm -hmm. exactly so yes asking for help I often tell people it's kind of like a running joke that people I think 
think I probably do the book work for our operation, right? Because I'm the female and that's what a lot of females do. And, and I don't, I don't touch our numbers because I don't enjoy it. I don't like to sit at a desk. And so it's just one of those many things that can be life-changing when you're willing to hire it out or figure it out or swap work or trade work to find somebody who enjoys that and can do it for you. Yeah, absolutely. So when we look at different ways to, you know, you mentioned like to pause with ourselves regularly and just check in and be honest, you know, how am I really doing, whether it's good or bad, but just be honest and recognize that. So if we are feeling moments of stress, anxiety, overwhelm, um, uncertainty, whatever it may be, whatever that thought is that's driving that, how do we, how can we take action or what are some tips or strategies to work through shifting that thought so that we can move forward. Because sometimes when those negative thoughts enter our brain, it's almost like we just sit there and spin. At least that's how I feel sometimes. And then they don't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So- it's, it's that whole pausing, right? Cause you recognize it. A lot of times it's because of a feeling like something feels uncomfortable or I'm feeling stressed or I'm feeling overwhelmed. And so I think we have to actually see where is the thought coming from? because we don't just have feelings, they're coming from some sort of thought. And I think that's sometimes the hard thing to recognize, right? Do I think that this is gonna go wrong today or what, right? What's the whole Mm -hmm. thing that is leading to this feeling? And then you have to check and see like, okay, is there something I can change? Do I need to leave a situation depending on how serious it is at that time? Um, is, and depending on how bad it is, right? Do I need to call somebody? Do I not need to get jump on the phone with somebody? Or do I need to just sit down and take a break? Do I need to leave the area that is causing me this stress? And so there's a lot of di- different things you can look at. And then even taking a minute too and thinking about, even though it's different for everybody, like what does make me feel good? It's for some people, it's just counting to four, taking some deep breaths. I mean, it's, I am, I am, <laughs> I'm like run and gun, like to rock and roll. And so sometimes when people are like, just do this box breathing, right? Like count mm-hmm. to four, breathe in and breathe out. And I'm like, okay, can we breathe a little bit faster? Um, <laughs> but, but it does, it makes a difference. If you can take a few minutes just to meditate and recognize, because it's, it's calming your whole nervous system down. Oftentimes what hap- is happening is that cortisol is rising. It's causing that stress and we can feel that within our body versus what do we want? We want those endorphins, those feel good feelings. And I often laugh with people because everybody gets their endorphins in different ways. I might go run and I'm going to feel so good. If that's what I need to do for some self-care, take care of myself, go run a couple of miles, somebody else that's going to cause a lot more stress or do more harm to go run a couple of miles. So they have to know what is it for them. And I think if you were to ask a lot of farmers and ranchers, I don't know how quick they would be to have an answer. You know, what, what do you do for fun when you are not working on the farm and ranch? What's your hobbies? What do you enjoy doing? Hopefully they would have an answer. I don't know. Do they pause and do they read? Do they go to the lake? Do they play with grandkids? Do they garden? What does that that self-care look like? for them as individuals? Do they know? I think a lot of social media responses I get on that is, oh, I go check cows, just go watch them in the pasture, which Mm -hmm. is relaxing. But, Mm -hmm. you know, what happens if you retire and can't do that someday too? You know, it's just, you should have, I think it's important for all of us to have something outside of ag directly to do, even if it just means visiting with friends, calling someone on the phone, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Well, like you said, it's sometimes how we label ourselves. Um, like it's our everything. So I, I do, I have to ask myself, even if my business was gone tomorrow, or if our ranching operation was gone tomorrow, who would I be? Like, what would I love? What am I passionate about? Like, who am I still? Absolutely. So, you know, these were great tips for what we can do for ourselves when we recognize it in ourselves. And, you know, that comes first, but what about if we're recognizing a family member, a friend, someone else in the community who looks like they're having a hard time, how can we kind of approach those conversations, talk about it and check in with them? Mm -hmm. Good question. And I have, I actually share this a lot of times. I've got a couple stories, unfortunately, of when I've done 
mental health first aid trainings. And one time I did, I ran into a friend who told me she was not doing well. And this was before I'd had any training and I had no idea what to say to her because I had no idea that she was struggling, um, very involved in the community, very active, just had a lot going for her or so you thought, right? And so it's always that don't judge a book by its cover and Mm -hmm. don't ever be afraid to ask people like, how are you really though? I know that you, you know, lost somebody not long ago, or I know the drought is impacting you or whatever the case might be. I just think we need to check in on people more often. And so I um, learned a few months later that that person had attempted suicide and luckily they're still alive today. But I think that was a changing moment for me when it's like, I had done nothing in that situation. You know, I didn't even follow up with them to see, hey, you said you weren't doing okay. Is there anything I can do for you? Um, Because what? We have work to do, right? Get back to our busy lives and we do our things. And it's almost like the elephant in the room. Like you want to just believe that everybody's fine. Well, they'll they'll be fine. I'm sure they're getting it figured out, right? Um, And similarly, it happened one time in a grocery store. Um, I was in a hurry, of course, like jogging across the parking lot because I had to go get Lainey from daycare in time and just wanted to get my groceries. And if you're like anybody else in a small town grocery store, you run into everybody there. And uh, I ran into, I saw a neighbor buy the fruit and I was like, oh shoot, I got to get fruit, right? And and I, I said to her, I said, hey, Karen, how are you doing? And Karen is usually very bubbly and fun and outgoing and that day she just kind of put her head down and, and she said, well, we're, we're doing okay. And I thought it made me pause because I had had this training. I learned more about mental health and recognizing it in other people instead of just being like, okay, good. Karen says she's okay, right? Because that's what everybody does. Everybody says they're okay. And a majority aren't. And I remember pausing for just a few seconds. And then I remembered her sister had passed away just a few days prior And we stood there and we talked for 15, 20 minutes talking about memories and funeral arrangements and family and just all the things that they had coming up. And had I not slowed down to recognize that in someone, I mean, she would have been fine, right? But she wouldn't have had that conversation that we did where she realized somebody cared about her. I think that's all that people want today is to feel valued, to feel noticed. And, um, I always repeat this. It's from John Maxwell. And he said this at one of his conferences that I was able to attend. And he said, walk slowly through the crowds. And as as busy as I like to be and, and running different places, that's a huge thing that I've taken away is to walk slowly through the crowds because you notice people more than more than you ever would before when we're focused on ourselves and all the things that we have going on instead Maybe I need to pay a little bit more attention to that neighbor who usually shows up for coffee on Wednesdays or that family friend who hasn't been at church for a while or isn't showing up to the neighbor brandings, right? Do I think I'm too busy to not check in on them and see how they're actually doing and to find out? They might be fine. That would be great. Um, But to actually pause and check in with them. And that's, I guess, something we cover in that class, mental health first aid, is what are the signs and symptoms what are we supposed to look for in people? And then what do I do? I guess, what are those next steps? I I catch myself being in a hurry a lot too, which is funny because I also catch myself complaining about how I have no social life and don't talk to any people, but then I hurry through the grocery store. I hurry when I'm picking up a part. I, you know, it's just this constant, you know, ending there's, there's a short podcast series and it's called, was it like end hurry and hustle or something like that? Or it's about ending that and how much different it actually changes your life, which is interesting because I Ooh, think I- I'm just bred to hurry, but <laughs> somebody recently, and now I'm not going to remember if, yeah, it was on Instagram stories or if a friend told me this, but they one day decided to take all their bills and go pay them in person, like at the different dealerships and stop at the bank and stuff, instead of like throwing them in the mailbox, right? They, mm-hmm. they like made it a point to stop in and, and visit with all the places that they do business. And I thought, huh, you know, it's just, it's a thought. We have the thought that we don't have time. I mean, everybody says that every single day that I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. Or we don't have time. Let's hurry up. We need to get going. It's just, 
I don't know. Sometimes it's, I think it's okay to sit and pause and think about, is this like, how do I feel? Right. Do I feel okay mm -hmm. with this about all the things I'm saying yes to what we're showing up to or what needs to pivot and change? And I don't think we're always willing to ask those questions because we have work to do. We think it's not worth our time to slow down and ask some of those hard questions or have some of those hard conversations. I think our sense of time is a little warped too mm -hmm. for how much we get done in a day. Or, you know, in some instances, like I think about on the weekends where I'm not on social media, there, there's magically a lot more time there. <laughs> or when your phone tells you like your screen time went up or down and like the number yeah. of hours it shows you. I'm like, if anybody sees this, I will be mortified. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But do you have anything else you kind of want to share, whether it's a tip or strategy to help people, you know, get their mindset or thoughts under control or anything else about the mental health side of things before we wrap up today? Oh, that's a good question. I think it's, if, if people ever have the opportunity to take any sort of trainings or courses or work with a coach or something, I think it can be game changing because it's so eye opening. It's easy to hear some of these things right and think oh yeah I need to work on that but then we just go back to work and we forget about it but really recognizing what our thoughts are even taking a peek at our habits right what's going good in life right now and then asking yourself like why is it though like why does that area seem to be working and clicking and functioning and these people are getting along and then maybe find this other area in your life where it just always seems to be a struggle or there's always a little bit of a barrier or the conversations and relationships aren't quite where we want them to be. So what is it? Like, what are the thoughts that are probably driving that? And, and it goes back to, okay, I can't change them. There's things that I can't change. I can't control those markets or the weather or whatever, but what are some of those things that if I, if I really paused, took some notes, wrote some things down mm -hmm. that maybe if I change them instead of, I, I said this already, but instead of always seeing things as a risk, like, ooh, but if we quit doing that and started doing this, like what if everything falls apart? What if you just had a different perspective? Like, what if this is the opportunity over here that has just been waiting for you in the back of your head, right? But we haven't been willing to try it because, well, we've never done it before, or it seems like it might not work out. And there's pros and cons, right? Make those lists, the pros and cons to trying different things. So, um, I, I have an online course that I'm launching soon. And so a lot of that will has to do with, okay, how do I find, instead of finding balance in my life, right? Things aren't going to be equal. There's, there's weeks that I'm gone and there's weeks that I'm at home. And so how do I find harmony? Like, how do I feel good about what my life looks like versus comparing it to the neighbors? And I think too often that ha happens thanks to social media, right? Mm -hmm. That's one of the pros and cons, but I always tell people, if you're going to compare, compare in a way that helps you. If I'm going to compare and bring myself down because I am looking at all of the great things she's doing and I'm looking at where I'm maybe struggling, that's the worst thing we could do versus, man, she's doing this. Maybe I could do this or I could try this. Use it in a good way. And so looking at what are those things that maybe I'm not enjoying in life. Maybe I'm on too many boards. Maybe I volunteer for too many things. Maybe I have too many enterprises like what fills your cup and, and you can't look at somebody else's cup to figure out what fills your own cup. I think we have to look at those things more often and be willing to kind of like they say, we, we do ranch, we've done ranching for profit a couple of times. Like they say, cut the dead tree branch, right? If you were willing to cut something or get rid of it, whether it's in your operation, your enterprise, or it's in your life, what if it could be a complete game changer? if you're willing to get rid of it. And so just taking some time, asking yourself some of those hard coaching questions that often we can't think of them in our own mind. It has to come from somebody else. It, it can just be completely, it can be a complete game changer within our lives when we're willing to do that. And I will say when I think about like, now that I've learned to pause and think about my thoughts about why did I wake up mad today? Why did this make me upset? I don't know how many times it's actually been because I was assuming something about how other people were, act, were going to act, were acting, what they were thinking. And it just, all I had to do was actually have a conversation about it and it was resolved. <laughs> like, 
a lot of it was in my own head too. So, and I'm so glad you said that because Shay, I got an email this morning that I'm kind of like, what, wait, why is that happening? It, right. Jumping to conclusions. And we do this all the time in, in our businesses or in agriculture, or especially if we're working with family and employees. And it's like, wait a second. And it's like, really, wait a second. Maybe I just need to ask them, can I get some clarification on this email? Or can, can you explain why we're doing it this way or why you chose that? And then, then I still have a choice in how I want that conversation mm-hmm. to continue, right? It doesn't have to be, well, why would you do it that way? It can be, okay, so here's another thought. Did you think about doing it, right? The two yep. different perspectives. There's always going to be different thoughts and ideas. And for that, we should be thankful on our operations, right? If it's just me, that's one thought. That's one idea. But when we can truly work as a team and be willing to have conversations with each other and know, right, having that thought that, hey, more heads are better than one. We're going to, if I hear from all five of us, we're going to be able to maybe combine ideas or she's probably got an idea that never crossed my mind for how Mm -hmm. we do something different this year. Absolutely. Well, Kelly, thanks for taking time out of your day to visit with me and share these tips with my audience for how they can uh, improve their mindset and mental health and relationships on their family operations. Yes, you're so welcome, Shay. Thanks for having me. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.